We've been a gospel preacher for 22 years. He also is the editor of the uh, House to House. Um, today, I do have a few updates and announcements I'd like to share with everyone before we begin. Just let everyone know Benny Nelson had heart surgery and is doing much better. Also, that Michael <coughs> Sandfield, he had a kidney transplant and he's doing better as well. The gospel meeting will continue from today on into Wednesday. After today's services, we'll have a fellowship meal. And also on the 20th, there'll be a men's business meeting. Participation today in today's services, the singing will be led by Greg Carter, the scripture reading by Logan Tooley, the opening prayer by Ricky Comer, and closing prayer by John Kirby. Now let's take a moment to focus on today and why we're here to worship God and observe a moment of silence. Thank you.
scripture reading for today will be Ephesians chapter 3, 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Most Holy Father in Heaven, we come to Thee recognizing Thee as the only true living God, Creator of this earth and all things. We're so thankful, Father, for the love that You have shown to us and given in Your Son, Jesus, that we might have forgiveness of our sins, that we might be covered by His blood. We're so thankful, Father, for the opportunity we have this morning to come together and to, to worship Thee. We pray, Father, that we'll be able to express to You our joy and our faithfulness. <coughs> and we pray, Father, that each day that we live, we strive harder to be the Christian that we need to be, giving You always honor and glory. We're so thankful, Father, for the, the avenue of prayer in which we can come to You and we can confess our sins. We pray, Father, that we would be able to see our sin, that we would analyze how it is that we uh, allowed ourselves to fall into Satan's trap, and that we would strengthen ourselves with our word, we would be stronger, and help us, Father, always have God to suffer. We know if we do that you will forgive us. We're so thankful, Father, for Alan Webster coming our way this morning. And being with us this week in this meeting, we pray, Father, that you be with him and him to boldly proclaim thy word. Help us, Father, to be attentive. Help us to take the things that we learn and apply in our lives, strengthen ourselves so we might be able to seek those who are lost. We pray, Father, for the lost. We ask the Father to be with us in our meeting this week. And we pray that we'll have an opportunity to influence many people. We ask the Father to be with this church here in this community. Help us to, to be the light we need to be, strong and bright. Help us not to flicker and waver, but help us to be strong in our word, strong in our might. Help us, Father, to have the faith that we need to have. Help us work each day to strengthen our faith so we might be stronger in ourselves. We ask the Father to be with those of our number who are sick, those who are on the prayer list, those that each one of us might be mindful at this time. We pray that you to be with them. And we pray, Father, that we'll bless them and help them to get better. And we pray, Father, that in their time of need, they look to Thee and be mindful of Thee and Thy Word. We ask Thee, Father, to be with this nation. We pray, Father, this nation would wake up and they would see their need for Thee before it is everlasting too late. Just be with us in our service today. We pray that all things will be in course of Thy will. Please, in my sight, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Please mark for the hymn of invitation number 453, number 453, be our hymn of invitation.
words were found written on an asylum wall and thought to have been put there by a man who was considered to be irrational. And yet, the poets and the philosophers of the ages have never rested them. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the sky of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. We could no more do justice to the subject of the love of God in one sermon in this morning's worship hour than a child could reach up and pluck a star from the sky at night. And yet even by attempting to do so, a child would call attention to the star and would point one in the direction of it. And in this sermon, I hope to call attention to the love of God in your heart and to point you in the direction of it. When David needed a sword, the priest said to him that the only sword that he had was Goliath's sword wrapped in a napkin and placed behind the, the ark. And David said, Give it me. There is none like it. 1 Samuel 21, 9. And this morning, there is no subject like the love of God to warm the heart of the sinner, to assure the heart of a saint, and to motivate us to want to be near God and to go to live with God. You know, we have figured out a way to measure just about everything. You can take a tape measure and you can measure linear feet. You can take scales and you can measure pounds and ounces. You can take a container and measure cubic volume or liquid volume. You can take a meter and measure electric voltage or usage. You can take, they've even figured out a way to measure the speed of the wind and the the size of an earthquake. But how would one measure the love of God? And yet the passage that Logan read in our hearing at the beginning of this service mentions the love of God is having dimensions, width and length and depth and height. How do you measure the love of God? Ephesians 3.18 Well, you measure it, but you can never measure it to its final Degree. You can say it is. it has this length, but it's without length. You can say it goes to this depth, but really you can never plumb the depths of the love of God. But that's what we'll try to do in this lesson. If you want a map of where we're going in the sermon, it's just going to be those four dimensions. We're going to look at the width of the love of God, the length of the love of God, the depth of the love of God, and the length or the height of the love of God. And turn with me to John chapter 3 at this point. And let's study what has been called the golden text of the Bible. It has been called the Bible in miniature. I speak of John 3.16, a passage that many have committed to memory even since a child. And yet, it's a passage that we never grow tired of studying. We never consider that we've outgrown that text. Because John 3.16 speaks of the love of God. And I had not noticed that the same four dimensions that Paul mentions in Ephesians 3 are mentioned by Jesus in John 3.16 and in the same order. So let's read this passage together. And it will serve as the basis, a textual lesson based on John 3.16 of those dimensions. Let's quote it together, or let me quote it in your hearing. You read it if you want to, or you can follow along in your mind as you think about being reminded of this great text. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that is a great text of the Bible. You, some, would, some would assign the two greatest text of the New Testament to John 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 13. It's interesting that both of them are on the subject of love. John 3 about 
vertical love, God's love for us, and then 1 Corinthians 13, our love for each other or for others. But let's focus on this love that God has for us. Notice first the breadth of the love of God. For God so loved the world. There's the width of the love of God. How wide is it? To whom does it reach? How far does it go? The love of God reaches to every person who is alive this morning. It reaches to every person who has ever stirred the dust of this orbiting sphere that we call earth. There has never been a class of people that were untouchable to God. That somehow they were beyond redemption. They were beyond the love of God. He did not care if they were saved or lost. There is no person on God's earth this morning that God is indifferent to. There's no person that God says, well, well, the devil can have that one. No, God loves every person who is made in His image, and that is every person. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now what that means personally is that the person that you see looking back at you in the mirror is a person that is dear to the heart of God. Someone said if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Have you thought about God's love in those personal terms? Now what it means when you think about the breadth of the love of God is that our evangelism is, to, is really a reflection of God's love. When Jesus had been crucified, buried in a tomb, came back alive on that Sunday morning, He was, he was on the earth about 40 days before He ascended back to heaven. Do you remember the last words that He gave to humanity before He returned? He took a nail-scarred hand and still had the hole in it. He pointed it at a world for which He had just died. And He said, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel, the good news, to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Now that's Mark's account of the Great Commission. But when you put together the other passages that are parallel with it, this is what you see. You go into all the world, to all nations, Matthew 28, 19, to every creature in every generation to the ends of the earth. That's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Luke 24, 47, and 49. And Romans 10, 18. That means that we go to all the world, all the nations of the world, all the citizens of all the nations in the world. We go to the ends of the earth, even to those citizens, those people who may live in out-of-the-way places that are not even known at times in history on an island somewhere, on a, in a mountain somewhere that's undiscovered at this point. And we do it every generation. We do it over and over and over until Jesus comes back. We continue to carry the Gospel to the whole world because there is no person that God does not want to be saved. First Timothy, first, uh, Timothy 2 and 4 says that God will have all to come to the truth. None rejected. 2 Peter 3, 9, all to come to repentance. So we carry the Gospel to people wherever they may be. I want, to, I want to think about it this way with you. Let's just use this illustration. I don't know where the closest airport is. I guess the International Airport might be Knoxville. So you go to, to Knoxville and you, you buy a ticket to the farthest destination served by that airport. And you fly, maybe you fly overnight, you land on another airport, and you go to a ticket counter, and you say, I want to go as far away from this in the same direction. Give me a ticket, and you buy that ticket, and you go as far as that airport will serve, and you continue to do that until you finally get to an airport that is as remote as any on earth, and then you go to the car rental. They ask, and you say, I want to rent a Jeep, and you get a Jeep, and you drive on the paved roads and then you drive on the dirt roads and then you drive until the road ends and you get the dirt bike out of the back of the Jeep and you go on the trails as far as the dirt bike will take you and when there is no trail you lay the bike aside you take out your machete and you begin to make a trail where there is no trail and you finally after days of cutting through dense foliage you end up in a, in a hollow or an opening, an outlet and there you meet people that have never been discovered by anybody on earth before, could you look them in the face and say, God loves you? 
You could, couldn't you? For there is no person that God does not love. Now you and I will never, will never go to that far away jungle and discover that people. But there are people that we meet on a daily basis at work and at school and across the fence to our property and in the supermarket and the gas station and the ball fields. There are people making the image of God that God loves that we can share that love with. And we share that by helping them to come to see that they are made in God's image. That God has a plan for them. That God wants them to be saved. And this is how to be saved. And that God wants you and His family, the church. And, and I can help you to know how to do that. And you could come and sit with me on my pew in the church services on Sunday or on Monday night or Tuesday night. And we can listen to the preacher preach about the love of God and about the will of God and about how to go to heaven. You see... That's the breadth of the love of God. It reaches to men of every race and rank, every class and climb, every tribe and tongue, and every generation. That's how wide it is. But let's think also about the length of the love of God. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the length to which God would go to save you and me. You know, sometimes we use length in that sense. That he, he loves his girlfriend so much that he quit his job so that he could be with her. She, she loves her family so much that she was willing to give up this so she could serve them in this way. She loved her mom so much that she quit her job so she could take care of her in her old age. We talk about love in terms of it loves length in those terms. And when you think about how much God loved us, He did not say, well, you know, I love them so much, I'll send them a bouquet of flowers from heaven. God did not say, you know, I love them enough, I'll sacrifice one of my angels to go down there and die for them. God did not say, I love them enough to give, give up a species of animals that I created so that they could be saved. No, God searched through the realm of heaven and found its very jewel, His own Son. And God said, this is how much I'm willing to give that man might be saved. I'm not going to give somebody else's Son. I'm not going to give some, someone or something that means nothing or little to me or even less. I'm going to give the very thing that matters the most to me. I'm going to give my own son. I'm going to give the one that I would I can I could nearer do without than any other person on earth or in the universe. And Jesus, being willing to come, came down to the earth, born as a babe, not a span long, helpless, taken care of by a Jewish teenager likely, Mary. He grew to be a toddler. He grew to be a child. He grew to be a teen. He grew to be a young adult. He, he lived a carpenter's life most of his life, but he turned, he closed, he shuttered the building and took down the placard when he was about 29 years old. And he became a preacher for about three years. And he went about doing good, but people hated him. And, and, and they arrested him and they condemned him and they beat him and they killed him and they put him in a tomb. That's God's son. Do you have a son? Do you have a child? I remember when our oldest son, who's 17 now, was only about um, six or eight months old, I guess. He had a uh, condition. They had to do a spinal tap on him at Children's Hospital in Birmingham. I was in the room. I tell you, I would have taken that for him if I could. It still hurts me to this day to think about it. But that doctor did that to help him get well. And he did. He's perfectly healthy. 
And he got out of that bed eventually and went home. But those who put the nails in Jesus didn't do it for his good. And he didn't go home. He went into the grave. And you say, why would anybody let anybody do that to their son if they could stop it? I'll tell you why. Because God loved you enough that if His Son had not have gone through that, you could not go live with God in heaven. You would have had to hear those words at the end, depart from me. And that means to a lake that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever, there's no end and there's no hope. And God said, I don't want that for you. I want you to go to heaven. I want you to be with me. The only way that it could be done was, was if Jesus' Son, if God's Son, Jesus, died for us. And God said, I will go to that length for you to be saved. We also think about the length, uh, the length of love, or length as a linear term, past, present, and future. And I want to explore that thought with you just for a minute about the love of God. I don't know who the oldest person in, in this congregation is. <coughs> Whoever it is, we have a, a member of Jacksonville who's 92 now. For the holder will be sitting about right there on the end of the pew this morning. <clears throat> he, he wasn't born before the love of God. God loved, the very first day He was on earth, God already was loving people. You go back to the early days when this nation was carved out of wilderness and God was loving people 250 years ago. You go back beyond that in, in history and you go back to the dark, to the Renaissance as men were coming out of the Dark Ages and the Word of God was being finally translated into languages that people could read and it spoke of the love of God who in that generation loved those who finally could learn of it. And you go back before that, that thousand years of, dark, of darkness, the dark ages, God was loving people during those years. And you go back before that to the days when the apostles were carrying the gospel to the continents and the island, islands and all the cities of the great Roman Empire. And God, God's love was on their tongues as they carried the gospel. And you go back a little before that when Jesus was on the earth and traveling as an itinerant preacher, preacher in and around Galilee and Judea. And God was loving people then. And you go back before that to the days of the prophets when they were preaching about the love of God and His judgment upon the nations. God was loving people then. But you go back to the days even before that of the, of the patriarchs. And God, they knew of the love of God. And even before that, when God spake out of eternity and He spake a world into existence that had not been there, and that was but another manifestation of the love of God. Ephesians 3.11 says, according to the eternal purpose... God had the eternal purpose of saving us in the church. That means that there was never a time when God did not love, even in prospect before we were created, and every day since then God has loved in the past. When you think about the present, you have never lived a single day of your life when God did not love you. The day you were born was a day when God loved you. The day that you turned to, God loved you. The day that was the worst day that you have experienced in your, in your world until today. The love of God did not flicker on that day somehow. And He didn't love you or His attention was diverted from you. God loved you that day as much as any other day you've ever lived. If you live to be in the future. I don't know who the youngest in here is this morning. But all things being equal, if the Lord delays His coming, that person, baby girl, boy is going to outlive everybody else. But they won't outlive the love of God. If they to be 100 years old, God will still be loving people. If this world stands for another 1,000 or 10,000 years, there will never come a day when God has run out of love. The love of God goes even into the world, the, the time beyond this world when there will be a judgment day. You know, I've been a, a W all my life. So, I've been in the back of a lot of lines. I don't anticipate at the judgment day an angel coming down with a clipboard counting. Somehow, he gets to the V's and he's 
checks off on his board and says, okay, right here, this, this is the end of the love of God. There's no more verses behind this point. Everybody from here on, there's no hope. No, it will go all the way to the W's, all the way to the Z's, and the last person in the Z's will have just as much love from God as the first of the A's. For the love of God has length, and then that without limit. Has anybody ever said to you, I'll love you forever? But they didn't. God loves us with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3. Jesus loved His apostles to the end, John 13, 1. He didn't, did not just love them as long as they were of some use to Him. He, they did not, he did not love them just so long as they did what He wanted them to do and did not disappoint Him. No, He loved them all the way to the end, even after they forsake, forsook Him and went into the darkness and left Him to His enemies, even after one of them betrayed Him and another denied Him three times, His love for them was still strong. And you know God's love is still strong for you and you've disappointed Him. And so have I. There's not, a, there's not a person, Isaiah 64, who does good and doesn't sin. We all sin. Our righteousness has filthy rags. You know, the best that we can do falls far short of the standard that He has set for us. But God does not base His love for us on that. He loves us anyway. He wants us to do better. He forgives us of our sins when we do as He's asked us to do. He welcomes us back. And on the last day of your life, when your strength is ebbing away, when you no longer even have a strength to, to say you love to express your love to your own love, your own immediate family. God's love, if you still have your cognizance, will still be strong your last day. You do not have to fear, as a faithful child of God, that somehow God's not going to love you. At some point in the future, there's going to be a marker in, in, uh, in heaven. You say, well, what if that marker is coming up? And you get up there and it says, the end of God's love. There won't ever be an end to it. Because God's love has breadth and that with, without limit. And God's love has length and that without end. And then number three, God's love has depth and that without bottom. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth should not perish. Whosoever. Now we talked about this from the, the large perspective. God loves everybody. But now we're going to talk about it on the micro perspective. God loves sinners. <clears throat> the, let me illustrate it first and then I'll, I'll make the application. Friedkopf Nensen was an explorer just to give you a, a time frame, it was during the time of the Civil War. He was not an American. And he was exploring, it was during that time frame, not just those four years, but over his 30 or so years of exploration. What he, what he was interested in was finding the North Pole. And what he did as he looked for it was to measure and to record the depths of the Arctic Ocean. One day as he was Measuring, it was near the end of the, end of the day, the daylight was about gone. And he had a measuring rope in those days, had a weight on the end, he let it over the side, and whenever it hit bottom, he would mark it and then pull it up and measure, and then write that in the log about this longitude and latitude is this depth. And so that day, he let down his rope, and he let it down, he let it down, and he went all the way to the end of the rope. And it did not hit bottom. And so the last record of that day in his book said the number of feet, like 500 feet, deeper than that. When, when he got up the next morning, he tied another rope to it, let it over, let it down and down and down. It went to the, it never hit bottom. And so a thousand feet. And he wrote on his log, deeper than that. Tied another rope, same thing, didn't hit bottom, deeper than that on another. And by the time he was done, he had tied all the ropes on the boat that could be spared together and let them down and he never found the bottom, evidently a trench of some kind. And the last record 
for that longitude and latitude and Friedkopf Nansen's uh, record logbook is deeper than that. How deep is the love of God? How could you measure it? Well, you could measure it by the kinds of love that we understand and experience. When you compare the love of God to the love that a man has for a wife or a wife has for a husband, and, and that can be an amazing love. But when you compare it to God's love, you'd have to say, well, God's love is deeper than that. If you compared it up with the love of a parent for a child, willing to, to sacrifice everything, even life if it were called for. But again, you have to say God's love for man is deeper than that. What about the love of a, a, a sibling for a sibling deeper than that? What about the love of a patriot for his country deeper than that? What about the love of a grandparent for a grandchild deeper than that? What, well, you can put any kind of love beside it. You want to and you'd always have to say that God's love is deeper than any love of which we are capable or have ever experienced. Now, what does that mean? It means this. God's love reaches down to man in the very abyss of sin. I have talked to those, and perhaps you have as well, who, are, who would who very humbly say, Preacher, I appreciate what you're saying about becoming a Christian, but God could never forgive me. I remember sitting down at our kitchen table years ago. There was a young man who had grown up in the church, but he had never been baptized. Grown up in the church in the sense we said, but he had never obeyed the gospel. He had married. She wasn't a member either. They had a son. We had gotten to be friends, and so we had a Bible study, and we got to a certain point in the Bible study, and he said, Alan, can I talk to you for a minute in private? And the wives dismissed themselves and went into another room, and he said, I want to tell you something that I've never told anybody before. And I would not use this illustration if there was any way that you would be able to trace it back to the person who said, I don't even know where this person lives anymore. They moved on. I, I, I could not locate them. His name was not John, but I'm going to say John. <clears throat> and John said, he was probably about 30 or 32 at this time. And he said, when I was a senior in high school, I was out on Friday night, putting some gas in my car. And there was a girl that I knew from school who came up and said, John, would you go in there and buy me some beer? I'm not old enough. They won't let me buy it. And she put $20 in his hand. And he went in and bought the beer. He brought it out and gave it to her. And then she was killed that night. In an auto accident. And with tears in his eyes, he said, Alan, I killed her. And I was so happy that night to be able to say, because he continued and he said, I can't be a Christian. I mean, I would be, but I, I killed somebody. And I was so thankful to be able to say, did you know that those who killed somebody in Acts 2 could be forgiven? Those who killed God's own son were not told you can't be saved. They were told to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are in your personal life and history. Maybe you've got some very serious regrets in the past. Maybe you've said before, i got too much baggage. You don't know where I've been. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how much baggage you have had. The love of God will reach down to you wherever you are. God will save you where you are. He will get rid of the baggage for you. That's the depth of the love of God. It also reaches down to us in the abyss of sorrow and despair. It reaches down to us in the, into the very pit of the grave and will one day raise us up out of it. And then as we close, 
We talk about the height to the love of God. And that's the last part of the verse. But shall have everlasting life. That refers to what the love of God is going to do at the end when He lifts us out of this low land of suffering and sorrow and sin. And He puts us in His own house. He lets us move in with Him. That's the height of the love of God. Now this morning I want to ask you the question, and please don't think about the person beside you or behind you or in front of you. Just for a minute, reflect personally. Are you ready to go home and live with God? You, you can't say that with any assurance unless two things are true about you. One is that you have obeyed the Gospel and every sin has been forgiven. The Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So have you repented of sins based on your belief in Jesus as the Son of God? And have you at some point in your past been baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Now there can't be any assurance of salvation unless God's plan of salvation is true in your case and He has saved you. Now, if it isn't true yet, it could be true this morning. There's water in that baptistry. You could be baptized even before the service ends. Before this day is completed, you could be a Christian. The second thing that must be true in order to have that assurance is that you have remained a faithful Christian since you were baptized. It doesn't mean you've lived a perfect life because none of us has. It means that you have not gone back into the world and sinned. You haven't lived a, a life of sin. You haven't sinned in such a way that others have judged the church negatively because of your words and actions and deeds. I don't know where you are. I, mean, I just met most of you for the first time. But if there's anybody in this room who needs to come, would you, would you embrace the love of God this morning? You know, one of the most unattractive things is unrequited love. For a, a child to reach up in love to a, a parent and a parent to shoo them away, you know? Or for a loving child to be abused by... I mean, that's unthinkable that that kind of love is not requited. For a, a wife to love her husband and for him to be unfaithful to her or vice versa. That's, that, that, that's, a, that's an ugly picture. But not quite as ugly as when God loves us and we say, Shh, I don't care. Don't do that to the love of God. Come to Him and say, save me. Come to Him and say, forgive me. We'll pray with you and for you. We'll do what we can to assist you. Would you let the love of God roll in your heart? Will you come? We'll stand all the same. I am resolved no longer.